All right. G'day, g'day. Welcome back to Collectivitis, the podcast where we dissect the disease that is collectivism. My name's Pietro. I don't have a Max today, but I have the next best thing, and that is a Jordan. Uh, no, so... you're, doing, you're doing Max a disservice. <laughs> 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 you're not meant to talk yet. You're you're not meant to be on the screen yet. You're right. I am do- I am doing Max a disservice. Max would have never made that mistake. <laughs> um, let me introduce him first. So he is a return guest, and last time we spoke with him, uh, he told us all about his his journey, which was um certainly interesting enough to warrant its own episode, which is why we kept it kind of to just that for for that episode there. Um, but he is also the federal secretary for the newly minted libertarian party and an absolute trove of knowledge and insight on everything from libertarianism libertarian philosophy broader philosophy but also importantly the law Uh, and why that is especially relevant is because we are going to talk about the law tonight and specifically something that the government is trying to do so first of all i'll welcome jordan jordan how are you Hello, Pietro. You're uh, too kind in your introduction, and I'm mindful I'm following in the footsteps of giants after your episode with the Honourable John Ruddock, and I'll see. So I'll try to live up to the uh, try to live up to the high standards of the podcast. Well, yep. Uh, thank you. Um, it actually stems from uh, the conversation that we had with John Ruddock just last week, where uh, he spoke about the upcoming uh, ACMA Powers Bill, which is facing um, all of us in the near future. And the potential threats that that might have. And I thought, well, uh, I know Jordan knows a lot about this uh, and potentially some of our viewers may have heard about it. Potentially some of them haven't heard about it uh, and they need to. And that's that's kind of the point that John was making. And I uh, thought I'd bring someone on who could tell us a lot more about it and the potential threats that we're all facing. So I'll, I'll hand it over to you. What is this thing that everyone's everyone in the libertarian world seems to have been talking about recently yeah libertarian and, and libertarian adjacent people like uh, senator ralph babbitt for the op um, one nation a number of parties who are sort of freedom adjacent as they might describe themselves have been raising a lot of noise about this and um, our party the libertarian party is in the process of um, concluding a submission to the draft exposure of the bill it's it's nearly finished and in the process of researching that and looking into the legislation more, having only sort of heard vaguely about um, the legislation and what it was intended to do, it's actually worse, I think, in many ways than it's being presented. This is legislation, so the the combating misinformation and disinformation bill, that these bills always have fantastic names uh, in, in the true fashion of any good, good historical propaganda uh, bill. Um, and What it actually sets out to do is not to curtail individual sort of speech or expression or individual publications or posts on a social media platform. What it actually does is worse than that. It actually imposes um, steadily increasing levels of regulation and pressure on um, industry bodies and uh, digital platforms like Telegram, Rumble, um, a number of these platforms which have been explicitly targeted because they have taken a uh, more uh, libertarian or more permissive approach to free speech. And in the report that has informed this piece of legislation, which is a report that makes recommendations to give ACMA sweeping and vast powers, of course, authored by ACMA itself. So ACMA was asked to investigate whether ACMA should have broad sweeping powers on this issue. And unsurprisingly, the answer ACMA came back with was yes we do need broad sweeping powers there is a serious social mischief problem here um by the way before i go into it more this was commissioned by the then morrison government in 2021 this report and so anyone who sort of seeks to paint this as some you know creature of the albanese government or some you know thing that could only have been dreamt up by the left well i can assure you that the right and the conservative right um love censorship and restrictions on freedom of speech when it suits them as much as if, if not more than than uh, your average socialist so, so, um, so sorry let me let me pause you there for a second um let's just rewind a bit and, and and explain the the super basics in case someone's never heard of any of this so acma being the australian uh, communication and media authority 
Australian Communication and Media Authority. So this is a government body, a government. Yes. Um, uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a government regulator. Uh, yep. ACMA, ACMA was conceived to regulate and report on um, various matters within the, the media and news sphere. And what ACMA has often ended up doing is sort of being a being a, a covering fire protection racket for mainstream legacy media. Um, ACMA was born out of self-regulating industry peak bodies initially. So initially news media in Australia was self-regulating and sort of largely sort of its own affairs in terms of editorial standards, news quality, all that sort of thing. And then as government became more interested in what was permissible and what sort of standards of quality of news um, would be permitted, um, regulatory uh, oversight and uh, and sort of powers began to grow. So ACMA has been around for a long time. As any government body does, it has a vested interest in not solving anything that it might have once been set up to solve, but finding new problems, um, finding things that need resources and staff. And, um, you know, it, it, they always have to be in search of the next the next uh, crusade and the next social mischief. And, and the beautiful word that they used in this report when this uh, bill was conceived and the recommendations they made was an infodemic. That's what we're experiencing, Pietro, an infodemic. And if that doesn't chill you a little bit to think of the language of pandemic being superimposed onto another social problem, then you're probably not thinking about it hard enough. And I think any of us who've lived through the last couple of years should be getting a bit of a chill down the back of our neck when we're hearing that language being deployed uh, because we probably know what's happening to our rights very shortly after that. Well, I think there is an infodemic. I think there's just too much information and I wish there was less of it. And I wish there was someone who could just tell me what the information that I can listen to is and that I can trust is. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, I, I do uh, want to play devil's advocate and and be the, the statist opposition to uh, the points that you're making. But um, I kind of wanted a broad, a broad understanding of, of what exactly the situation is first. Uh, so currently, what can ACMA do uh, before these powers that uh, are being suggested? So at the moment, ACMA's role in relation to this sort of topic or this area of digital media is very much one of oversight, uh, broad oversight and reporting. So they're not really empowered to impose um, an industry um, an industry standard. Um, and some of this stuff will sound really government legalese and, and it'll make a lot of sense to the average viewer, but basically you have sort of three tiers um, when it comes to industry regulation. You have self-regulation, so that's the industry regulates itself. That's where we're at currently in, in effect. Um, for a lot of this newer media, especially um, digital platforms like Telegram that have sort of only been around for the last couple of years, they're not part of the old media where there might be some sort of news media code like the, the mainstream media and masthead news publications daily like the Australian and the Age and all these sorts of things. They, they would have some form of self-imposed essentially self-regulation, that they agree, this is how we're going to go. This is what the process is that we're going to do. This is what we will and won't publish. And with the rise of these digital platforms, uh, ACMA is now becoming increasingly concerned and what it's, what it's looking to do and what the primary effect, primary thrust of this bill is to do is to give it the ability to put the industry on notice. So they're going to say to either the industry as a whole or particular digital platforms, we believe that your current policies and your current self-regulation setup for disinformation and misinformation. We'll go into more into what that means later on. But they, they, they have, they're going to have the power to say, we want to know what your policies are, how you're handling this. We want you to report to us on all the instances of uh, misinformation and disinformation you've dealt with. And then if we're not happy with how you're managing this, we are going to have the power to impose first an industry standard upon you, which is like a sort of a ratcheting up or a higher level again of regulation and self-regulation. And then if that fails and the industry standard still doesn't achieve the outcomes we want, we're going to impose an industry code. And that's then the highest sort of form of regulation where it's a binding um, binding code that there are um, extremely severe penalties for, for infringing upon it. And essentially the government takes over 
regulation of that industry. So you might have heard, for example, building construction code. Um, industries like the construction industry that are very, very heavily regulated um, have a code that is imposed on them. And at the moment, the media is sort of in this self-regulating um, pattern at the moment. So when and um, uh, the of the three tiers of regulation, self-regulation is obviously a libertarian uh, free market view of how regulation should work. Yeah, but by, by um, means, and, and a libertarian view is that if YouTube wants to cancel John Raddick's maiden speech, we obviously, you know, vigorously disagree that they should. We, we don't think they should, but they should be free to. Under, under contract and property rights, they are operating a service. They set the terms and conditions of that service. If we as users agree to the terms and conditions of that service, we can freely limit the, the speech and the, the content we can share on that. There, there's no in principle libertarian problem with restrictions on um, con contractual or private property restrictions on freedom of expression. That That is as it should be. And what would happen as a result of that, as is the case, is YouTube has a bullshit socialist uh, approach where they take down um, MPs made speeches. And so platforms like Rumble, Telegram, platforms that are more disruptive and more innovative, more agile, uh, they are sensing that the market has a a gap that can be filled for platforms that are more permissive when it comes to what people can say and do on their platforms. And they are servicing those customers. And so mainstream media has been dying and, and losing hemorrhaging customers for a long time to challenges like YouTube and Facebook. Now in turn, YouTube and Facebook are facing the, the force of market powers and the, the beauty of the market economy is operating on them. And they're in turn finding that newer competitors with a more attractive offering for people who want to be able to say things that are controversial or dissenting are going to these new platforms. And so what ACMA is saying is like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. We, would, we were just getting used to the idea of Facebook and YouTube and we've finally brought these people to heel and we're finally getting them to impose very similar standards and very similar, um, you know, rules around what can and can't be said and very, um, you know, strikes and takedowns and all this sort of thing. And now this this new tier of digital platforms like you know TikTok and Telegram and all of those kinds of things are basically ignoring ignoring the rules we want them to impose. So and and look, that makes a lot of sense because Telegram, right? I, I I'm not sure how much Telegram existed prior to to COVID, but I remember Telegram like suddenly popped up out of nowhere as the place to go to you know combine with a community of dissenting opinions during the whole lockdown mandates i think it's a bit like yeah, so it existed it existed not long before COVID. but if you wanted to buy shares in something if you had a time machine you'd go back and buy <laughs> shares in zoom and telegram that's for sure yeah okay so so right yeah so it existed but erupted because of um and erupted because it sold itself as you know the place to go if you didn't want to be censored um but it was clear by that point that certain of the big ones, like you mentioned, Facebook, uh, YouTube, um, Twitter at the time, uh, were completely, completely beholden to what the government narrative was. So was this, um, and in various forms, obviously ACMA is just Australian, but was this part of the purview of what ACMA and government, like how did they bring these groups here to heal? Because uh, fa Facebook, for example, was not... Um, the censorship oh, shithole that it currently is forever. I remember there was, uh, I, I think to my memory, it coincides with Donald Trump's election, yes, more or less. I was about to say, US presidential election uh, of Donald Trump very much, um, I think was the beginning of what, what I believe the biggest threat for these renewed additional steps ACMA wants to take and what this legislation proposes. The biggest threat is that these new companies that are sort of escape hatches if you want if you want like they're essentially parachute uh, options for people to move to platforms that offer them a space to say these things that they want to say and what the intention of this bill is the intention of the government the intention of ACMA is that they will not be the ones swinging the axe they will not be the ones taking content down or targeting individual posts or content um, indeed, their strong preference would be not to have to set one of these standards or codes. What they want is the chilling effect of self-censorship. And throughout history, that has been some of the most uh, powerful soft power that the state has exercised um, from anything to preventing Scottish rebels 
um, in British history from owning printing presses um, to sort of try to, you know, quell these Scottish rebellions to, you know, information about hand, proper hand washing and hygiene being, you know, viciously prosecuted by the, by the medical establishment at the time and, and sort of essentially 50 years passed in between the discovery of the idea that you should wash your hands in between the morgue and, give, and attending to childbirth. 50 full years passed before that was actually accepted by the medical, uh, the medical uh, discipline. And, and all of these dangerous ideas that have been suppressed from time to time, first and foremost, are suppressed through self-censorship. And, um, you know, the guidance note that accompanies this draft exposure bill, it, it, I'm torn always when I read these kind of things with, with government between laughing and crying, because the guidance note says, the purpose of this bill is not to curtail freedom of speech. That, that's not what we're doing here. You know, we're not going to be removing content. We're not going to be, you know, uh, infringing on people's freedoms. That, that's not what we're about. We're about preventing harm. But then they just either blissfully ignore or willfully misrepresent the absolutely intended effect that they are getting these digital platforms to carry the can and commit the censorship. So the fact that they're, they're, they're laundering their, their censorship through third parties and pressuring companies to suppress free speech on their behalf doesn't in any way absolve them from the fact that that is, that is absolutely undeniably and inevitably the result of what this legislation will will have and y y this is like especially terrifying when you think of like the broader context of it all so legacy media uh the old you know the tv news stations for, for so long had managed to to cut public discourse to within the allowable frame that the government um wanted to project and in many ways trump in 2016 along with brexit i think was the same year like these kind of moments um showed how technology and new media were this powerhouse of uh you know it was this location where people could go to hear big important um personalities or uh, talking points that showed views completely outside of that allowable overton window of opinion and this was something that was really exciting about new media. Like this was the whole thing, you know, as much as the state grows, technology is providing an out that is so much more exciting. And, you know, the fact that, and, and this is still true in many ways, you know, if you think about the fact that um, Tucker Carlson, for example, on Twitter has a, a bigger following than many of the legacy uh, news media stations in the US because um, there's a market for that. People want to see that. And um, this new media is what allows that. And it sounds like this, you know, the ACMA in Australia is the Australian version of what is probably happening elsewhere as well, is trying to, is the government trying to come to terms with how it can turn this new media into the same, uh, the same, you know, base for their allowable opinion as they've had in the past. Well, it's actually worse than that because what happens is because Australia has no uh, Bill of Rights, because Australia has no Charter of Human Rights and no real protections on free speech, Australia is the testing ground for these ideas. And then they're often implemented in sneakier ways because other places have better protections than we do, but we are the, the petri dish at the forefront of limitation of freedom of speech. So unfortunately, Pietro, your assessment is too optimistic by half, which I never thought I'd say to you. Uh, <laughs> but in fact, Australia is at the, the leading edge of finding out ways to, to bring these, these dissident social media platforms and digital platforms to heal. So the, the rest of the world watches on with bated breath to see how, how beautifully we crush and silence uh, dangerous <laughs> ideas. That's right. Like, I mean, it, it makes sense. I'm, I'm um, smiling. I'm smiling and I'm, I'm laughing about it. But in reality, there, there's nothing funny about it. And, um, and really, I'm furious, as, as I'm sure you are and as any of your listeners should be. It is, as, I, as hopefully is now becoming clear, it's, it's even worse than if the government was simply to tell you there are things you can't say, because it's, it's worse than that. They're taking away spaces for things to be seen. So they're not, they're explicitly in this legislation trying to prevent what they refer to as serious harm caused by disinformation and misinformation. We'll go into all the elements and sort of unpack them a bit because they are worth worth dwelling on because each of them have their own set of problems that 
even if you ignored everything else out the bill, about the bill, each, each area of this bill has really, really significant problems. Even if you assumed that this was a good goal, that the goal of limiting uh, spaces for information that is in the minority or that is dissenting or that even is completely wrong, even if you believe that that is a worthwhile social goal um, to prevent serious harm, this bill will not achieve that and is seriously and irretrievably flawed. So fortunately, you don't even have to believe that the state shouldn't be doing this to disagree with this bill. So any, anybody should disagree with this bill. And and the the, the point I was also making before, which um, is is kind of to that end as well, is um, what what ends up happening is that this isn't, as you said, it's it's not even uh, a heavy handed. It doesn't seem like a heavy handed thing that the state does because it means all these people who have made now careers and who have made uh, who gained a follow uh, following and because of this have been able to um, speak to a wide number of people and make that their whole life and dedicate a lot of time to researching these things and, and fighting against um, the, the 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 inherent statism now because their entire livelihood rests on the fact that their YouTube account needs to be up. It needs to be available, that their, um, uh, you know, their, their Twitter following needs to be able to see what they want to say. Their Facebook following needs to be able to see what they want to say. And these three strikes you're out can completely wash out their livelihood and can do this to any number of people. Um, it, it, there's the whole effort of people with these big followings um, trying to get their viewers onto Rumble because they know there's the likelihood that YouTube will eventually shut down. This overarches even that, even the, these sort of like attempts. Well, well, it's not, it's not to... overarching, it's responding. It, it's, it's saying what they are doing is working and effective and we, we envisage that that will be effective, that people are moving to platforms that we can't impose this soft power self-censorship on. They're moving to platforms that are prepared to defy us. And and this, this legislation... It's not just like, oh, one step ahead, two step ahead. It's, it's responding directly to the reality of that. And the report that informs this bill is really, really clear and explicit about the sorts of things that um, are concerning ACMA and realistically both the Liberal Party and the Labor Party. They're talking about COVID-19. Um, they're using language like to actually test their percentages of who was misinformed and highly misinformed and all this sort of thing. The question they used as their control question was, do people agree with, and to what extent do people agree with, the published doctrine around mask wearing at the time, as of 2021? So so their, their test for whether someone was misinformed or not was whether they agreed with the official position on masks at a particular point in time in the COVID pandemic. So now, this this is the, the report which they provided to the government, which has now... Yes. Um, Led to this made bill. the government, yeah, led to the government yes. giving them or, or trying to give them these powers. And so yes. in in that report, the question yes. they asked was something which is now a completely like proven a, beyond a, a shadow of a doubt. Absolute false best, way. strongly contested. Yes, and there's yeah. other there's other stuff in there like they're talking about um, views that are vaccine hesitant. Now that is a spectacular faux pas where you have. Like by the day, more reports coming out about the true scale of vaccine injuries, the true scale of risk and liability that was signed away by the government to ensure that big companies like Pfizer and Moderna didn't didn't have any any worry about being sued for the for the uh, possible side effects of something that was rushed and known to be risky, far more risky than was admitted freely. And so all of these things in the report. And it's sort of like, it's, in a way, it's pretty breathless and it's it's aged so badly. Whether they've hidden this report like in the text before the actual exposure bill. And they're just like, oh, here's like a little like, link that we hope you don't look at. Because if you actually read this, this thing, nearly every single point that they're using as an example of something that is dangerous misinformation capable of causing serious harm has in fact been significantly eroded by the passage, by simply the passage of two years. So we're yeah. not talking 10 years, we're not talking ancient history. Um, you know, this is this is so obviously a bad idea that even the examples they have sought to use to furnish their own arguments have already been extremely, extremely heavily um, criticised and questioned. So this this report that they provided to the government was this from two years ago when when these when 
you could argue uh, more justifiably that, you know, this stuff was misinformation, disinformation because it was blasted everywhere. And I'd say the majority of people were on board with it. Um, yeah, but was that's, that that's exactly was... it. So, so it was from 2021. But that's exactly the point is if you make government or government regulators the arbiter of truth, all they're going to reflect is what the consensus is at any given point in time. And that's not that's not the same as what is true. <laughs> and and the act itself, which we should probably start getting into, the act itself contains no definition for the crucial term of false, misleading or deceptive. So to qualify as disinformation or misinformation, matter that's published has to be false, misleading and deceptive. The act doesn't define that. The bill does not provide the crucial definition that engages all of these broad sweeping regulatory and punitive powers for digital platforms that don't comply. And if, and again, in the uh, guidance and in the, pre the, pre the preamble to the draft exp exposure bill, ACMA says, ACMA will not be determining what is true and what is not true. And that begs the question, as bad as that would be, if ACMA isn't determining what is true, then who is determining what is mm. true under these rules? And what the answer is, is twofold. Firstly, it's going to be left up to social media and digital platforms to determine what is true. And of course, without guidance from the people who will be monitoring, regulating, and potentially punishing them for getting the answer wrong, these digital media platforms are going to err on the side of what is uncontroversial and safe. So you're going to get this, already you have this, this chilling self-censorship effect from the way that the regulations and the threat of further interventionary regulation is set up. Then you have no clear definition for what is meant by the most fundamental premise in the bill, that is, what is false, misleading or deceptive. And suddenly you have this perfect storm where platforms that this applies to, which will be every digital platform, with a few exceptions, again, we'll come to this in a moment, but all of these digital platforms that are currently providing platforms for free speech will be put in the position where they will have to preemptively self-censor anything that they feel is too controversial or too at risk of being of being deemed to be false, misleading or deceptive. And that, it's, it's just outrageous. It's, it's, it's horrific because, and it, it's to, to simplify it to, to the, the most basic terms we can say, it's the government or ACMA holding a hammer above these um, social media, new media companies saying, if you allow the wrong thing to be said on your site, there is a punishment yeah. and the wrong thing is wink wink you know what the wrong thing is yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's not difficult to understand what allowable opinion and non-allowable opinion is everything left every left woke progressive idea that expands the government or entrenches its power is of course allowable opinion so it's not like it's going to turn any of these into like really uncontroversial on both sides kind of entities where you know instagram and facebook and all the rest of it just get turned into this place where people can only show photos of their pets and on twitter you can only talk about how uh, delicious your ice cream was on the weekend no it's going to censor the you know the hammer over wrong opinion which we all instinctively know what these wrong opinions are if you're tuned in and what you can say and what therefore becomes the new um not just a loud opinion, but like the, the, the new public opinion, what everyone can see, the, the, the outfacing public opinion group is this, the, this group think is this horrifically one sided on the wrong side, objectively, if you want the truth, um, you know, view of the world, which which is you know, <laughs> completely, completely harmful to everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And the second answer to the question of who determines what is the truth? is the courts in the final analysis would determine what the truth was if a digital platform was so motivated to defend their users' freedom of speech and take this risk that they would take this phenomenal gamble of risking regulatory intervention, fines, court costs of court costs if they lose this case, and then taking this, this case over a particular alleged breach of a code to the courts. And even then, if you got to court and a digital platform was that motivated, the courts would be left to try to determine what is false, misleading or deceptive. And the only other place in current legislative framework that uses that terminology is the Australian consumer law. So you have uh, provisions in the Australian consumer law, which make a defense to um, engage in misleading, deceptive 
conduct with relation to products. But the difference between information and a product is you can test whether a claim about a product is true. You can say, this is not something that has solar batteries. This is not something that won't need to be charged for three hours. This is not something that will last for a year. You can't test information against anything other than a lowest common denominator, broadly held majority opinion. And that doesn't tell you anything about the substantive truth of the claim. And you can so, see that being being like completely false, even if we just look back at the, the, the COVID idea, like during when mandates were being brought in, there were a, a whole heap of um, people taking these to, to court to say, you know, this is unethical, this is morally wrong, you can't do this, this is illegal, et cetera. And they were all struck down, all bar none. Every single one of these was struck down at the time. And there were ones with huge followings. I remember I was part of one with um, like, I can't remember, tens of thousands of teachers who were putting uh, these forth and they were all struck down and now there's stuff coming there's stuff being brought up to court and there's victories being had about how they were unlawful and they were illegal and people are getting some people are getting paid reparations. like now they're admit so already you know the the at that moment they made this decision which would then if we take it back to the example of current new media if they make this decision and say, okay, no, that was false, misleading, um, and whatever, that serves as precedent, and then everything can, like, a, a social media company is not going to take the next case to it after they've already lost the first one over this thing, which is only true in that moment. It can be disproven within just a year or two's time. Yeah, that's exactly right. So there is no, and, and also what it means is because the government isn't taking this step to remove your content, the government isn't imposing itself on your implied freedom of political communication. You can't, you can't sue the government um, saying that they're overreaching and you know acting unconstitutionally or anything, because they're not the ones. It's it's they're sort of almost putting this buffer um, of the veneer of commerciality or the veneer of these digital platforms being the ones who are handing out these rules. Mm -hmm. They're saying, oh look, we didn't tell them to do that. They, they've just done this thing, you know, like it's a we're, private we're company. Standard. Exactly. It's a private company. What do you want? This is capitalism, isn't it? Yeah. This is what you people, this is what you people want. <laughs> this is your capitalism for you. Yeah. Yes, no, yeah have, have your cake, eat it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and, and I, I guess, yeah, that's, that's also an important element is that, you know, the government's ability to detach themselves from the blame in this, but it, despite it being entirely from them. Um, so more, more kind of, pertinently how how is this bill going to be decided like wh when is it happening who decides on it um who has the the current power uh to to allow acma to have these powers so basically at the moment we're at what's called the draft the exposure draft stage legislation so it hasn't actually gone to parliament yet this is more or less a, a kite flying exercise so this is what government will do where they'll, they'll put out the draft exposure bill, they'll seek submissions. So people like the Libertarian Party, individual citizens, and I can't recommend strongly enough, anyone watching this podcast who is motivated to do so, type in ACMA disinformation bill into Google, and that will take you through to the um, ACMA submissions page. They've actually extended the deadline. It was the 6th of August, but it's now the 20th of August. So I'm not sure whether that means that they've had a lot of feedback and none of it's what they want and they're trying to give more time to, to receive more favorable responses i always look at extension of deadlines um with a bit of a, a knowing eye because very often extensions of deadlines are saying well we've asked for opinions we'd love some more you know mm. <laughs> if we could get some better opinions that'd be great here's another two weeks uh, but basically from there what will happen is the submissions to the draft exposure bill um will be received They'll be taken taken into account possibly um, by the the drafters now the drafters of this legislation is not going to be a minister it's not the parliament and this is a really important part of the legislative process for people to understand the people writing this legislation are not your elected representatives they're not the minister they're not the minister's staff they are the faceless public servant employees of a department um, that are breathlessly doing all this so that they can sort of justify their continued existence and, and ideally expansion. Um, the submissions will be published. So there will be um, a, a public sort of display of those submissions. And then those submissions will inform any amendments 
um, to the draft exposure bill. They might release another draft if they, if they make substantive amendments as a result of submissions. Um, it's also not guaranteed that this draft exposure bill will proceed to parliament. So I think from a soft power point of view, really making it clear that because this isn't this isn't the Albanese government's legislative agenda. This is this is on the this is in the outtrade from the Scott Morrison government. And Mark Dreyfus is very problematic in a lot of respects, but he is a very competent lawyer. Um, he isn't a fool, and he is probably not very inclined to take a lot of political flack over this when it, it isn't something that the Albanese government committed to. It isn't something that um, has been, say, the subject of a you know, conference or gathering in the middle of Australia or anything else that might put political pressure on people to stick with things that seem increasingly like a bad idea. So there is, there is the opportunity through making these submissions. The next sort of three weeks that we have, um, you can make even the most detached from reality public servant working five days a week from home. Life is good. COVID, COVID was a, a good vacation. Even these people who have absolutely no link to reality whatsoever, um, if they receive thousands of submissions that say, this is outrageous, don't do this, mm. it's, it's possible that um, they might think twice about putting it up. Now, if it does go to Parliament, either in this draft form or with um, certain amendments, as I've said, and there's, there's one more thing I want to talk about in the bill that just makes it irredeemable, but they won't change. And even if they amended it um, to make it more palatable and put it to Parliament, you would then have a situation where the Labor government would need the support of either the Greens um, or the Liberal Party, essentially. If the Liberal Party and the Greens both oppose this, we've seen from the um, housing fund legislation that, that the Albanese government is now proposing for a second time, if the Liberals and the Greens vote against something, then it, it won't pass at the moment as things stand. And the Liberal Party, notably on this, has you know what we call kept their powder dry. They haven't um, expressed a strong view publicly one way or another. They've, they've kind of made noises like they might fight it. They'd be massive hypocrites if they did, but I'd still take their hypocritical um, no votes against this bill. Um, but there's every chance that they'll still think this is a great idea, um, that they won't do the right thing because we saw time and again at a state level in Victoria during COVID, the Liberal Party were compliant and collusive with the Labor government. Um, they didn't put up a fight. They just went along with it because they didn't want to take any political flack when they thought they were getting wins in other areas. And the Greens, likewise, you mentioned earlier that, that there would be sorts of um, controversial views or um, outside the acceptable window views that, that this might allow. But you've got to remember, and the left, I think, do know this to an extent. Some of, some of the, the Greens and, and other associated sort of left-wing parties, I think, do probably appreciate this more maybe than the Labor Party does. And that is that imagine if Peter Dutton um, had the levers in, of an administration where these powers could be used to suppress um, people arguing for human rights, whistleblowing, um, immigration and refugees, um, treatment of people in prisons, all manner of things which, um, you know, energy policy, all manner of things which, which the left um, tamper, children overboard, all these things where Iraq war, WMDs, there, there's so many issues on the left um, that have been dissenting minority views that ultimately were borne out and they have just as much to fear from the effects of this legislation as anybody does. I mean, yeah, and and I suppose that does make sense as well, considering that a lot of the most woke progressive ideas um, stem from the Greens and those are the ones that are having the most violent opposition from the right. So there is also like, you know, trans stuff that that could be a reaction from uh, a future liberal government to to ban that sort of thing and obviously they don't they don't want that um either so sorry i it just um i had a couple of questions before you you, you were going to go on but I'll, I'll um while we're on this and the kind of broader context of how exactly it could pass so it seems to me obviously um i there's not there's not a lot uh of this going around with in comparison to the enormous noise that right now uh the voice which is very much albanese's you know flag bearing charge into trying to get re-elected is is um whether or not the voice succeeds is, is almost a, a referendum on whether albanese 
whether people want Albanese in government or not. Um, so given the fact that there's all this noise around the voice and, and everyone's distracted by, you know, vote yes, vote no, whatever, um, it would seem that the people who are submitting these recommendations or not whatever the submissions to the to the um to the current draft bill would be mostly libertarian or libertarian adjacent minded people so it, it, is it likely that a lot of the submissions that they're receiving at the moment are an inundation of uh these sorts of submissions yeah i think this issue hasn't really broken through to the mainstream consciousness i think the people that it is alarming are people who are very vigilant and aware of free speech restrictions um i should note as well that this is continuing in the sort of footsteps of the online safety act which created the e-safety commissioner and basically has broad sweeping powers to determine that online content is toxic or abusive and all this sort of thing, which all sounds really good and, you know, that it's trying to achieve all these noble goals. But it created a precedent that, you know, speech that we dislike or speech that is fringe speech or expression that isn't mainstream is somehow not legitimate or is worth subsuming into this idea of, of, of the, the greater good or the public good. Um, and interesting, you mentioned about the voice, because one of the specific types of serious harm that this bill and the kind of stuff behind it, the reports and the guidance notes behind it specifically mentions is the serious harm that would arise if an electoral commission were accused of uh, being biased or um, unfair in their conduct of a referendum. That is word for word, one of the, the items in their table of serious harms. So it isn't unrelated that this is kind of rearing its head and being pushed through ahead of the voice referendum because um, they have they have explicitly said that it will be an instance of misinformation or disinformation causing serious harm if people um, say that the AEC was biased. And we have this week had um, a case of the AEC being absolutely roundly criticised by a federal court judge for being unjustifiably and unreasonably biased against Craig Kelly um, in trying to prosecute him for breaches of the Electoral Act for his um signage and authorization font size so in the same week that we've had a a on the record example of a judge saying the aec is biased and not impartial and has acted inappropriately and unjustifiably we're looking at this legislation saying that it will be misinformation for uh, the wrong kind of people or the wrong kind of platforms to say that it's like it, it's the thing is, you say you say it's not a laughing. It's comical. Like it's comical. The, the timing of so many of the yeah, you, you yeah exactly. Not. It's yeah. it's um and, and, so and just quickly as well that that one final point with this legislation is the worst the absolute worst part of this whole thing is that even if you accepted everything we've said so far, and you go, yeah, I don't see the problem. Jordan Pietro being alarmist, you know, you libertarians, what are you worried about? This bill specifically excludes three types of digital platform from the provisions of the misinformation and disinformation bill. Government departments, the ABC and the SBS, and legacy news media. And if you are on the left and you think that the Murdoch press should be able to say something that someone on Telegram or someone on, on uh, Rumble shouldn't be able to say, then you have some serious life priorities and uh, internal consistencies to work out with yourself because um, here, the bill really shows that what it also is, in addition to uh, being um, a, a chilling, self-censoring attack on free speech, it is also a protectionist racket attempting to shore up the business model of these dying mainstream media legacy institutions who are being competed against um, in an even more fearful way than the government is by these new disruptive bodies. So it's so it literally excludes three um, types of organisations which have routinely um, basically dragged the curve and only belatedly acknowledged what a lot of these digital platforms and people on them have been talking about for a long time. Um, today, The Australian had a, a, a front page cover, you know, COVID misinformation. There was a cover up, nobody reported it, including you, The Australian. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely self-serving and it just leaves these gaping holes you could drive a Mack truck through that we should somehow say that mainstream media, the ABC and the government are more reliable and trustworthy and have a higher quality of information than uh, than Telegram or Rumble. I, I feel like you've just spent this whole this whole interview telling me that it's worse than I thought. 
and it just it just keeps getting worse than I thought. So it, like it's not even just the insidious self censoring that would come from people being wary of saying the wrong thing and getting deplatformed. It's also an overt hey, we're protecting these protected species. Like it's yeah. not even it's not even hidden. No. Uh, it's no, exactly right. And and if you remember back in twenty twenty one the um, the digital media negotiation uh, laws that made Facebook and Google pay mainstream media literal protection money or revenue that the government forced them to give them revenue for hosting hosting their news content on their services. So that so they're basically saying, okay, we're going to help our buddies out in the mainstream media by forcing uh, more innovative private competitors to pay them literal rent seeking protectionist money. And now we're going to basically put up an information barrier that that elevates the certain types of contents, trustworthiness and truthfulness over their competitors. So you couldn't have a better friend in business than the government. Well, and, and like, yeah, that's that's the most core libertarian inside of all is that, you know, um, the system we live in is not capitalistic, uh, not capitalist. It's it's a crony version of it where the richest and most uh, monopolizing of entities in any department are the ones that have friends in the government and who who use the government to monopolize. And I mean, this is obviously, obviously exactly what's happening here. Um, so, uh, to go back a little bit, we, we were going to talk about misinformation and disinformation specifically. Um, so obviously the, the misinformation that they ha that we've all heard about for the last, you know, whole entire COVID hysteria is the misinformation surrounding vaccinations and the misinformation surrounding, uh, you know, your ivermectin and your, um, as a, you know, the horse dewormer and anything else that, um, you know, lockdowns being, uh, unnecessary and, um, masks not working and all the rest of it. So what is the misinformation that they are currently looking or what's the explanation now for, for the misinformation and disinformation that they're going with? So I'll, give, I'll give you some of the examples that they use and the wording they use very, very cleverly seems to avoid, if you took this, if you took this language one step further, I'll for each one, we'll go through it and I'll, I'll get you to tell me what, what jumps to mind. Hatred against a group in Australian society on the basis of ethnicity, nationality, race, gender, sexual orientation, age, religion, physical or mental disability. Serious harm number one. Nazis. <laughs> Nazis. That makes me think I mean, of Nazis. Serious harm number two, disruption of public order or society in Australia. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like the, the example they give is misinformation that encourages or calls people to vandalise critical communications infrastructure. But why would that definition of harm not extend to protests or not extend yeah. to failure to you know, comply with curfews or lockdowns? There is no, there is no logical difference between that definition of harm, mm. the example they've given, takes it to a level where people go, oh, yeah, of course, we need to stop doing mm. it, we need to stop that. That's not what the bill says. This, this is in the guidance note next to the bill to give people like, oh, this is, this is what we intend to do. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm telling you right now, it doesn't matter what a government department or public servant who's drafting legislation intends to do. It matters what kind of government of the day you get away with on the wording of that legislation. Mm. Um, harm to the integrity of Australian democratic processes or of Commonwealth, state, territory or local government institutions. So it might be <laughs> a serious harm if you are criticising the council and you know inferring that the council is corrupt. When in Victoria, a huge council was absolutely found to be corrupt for taking different payments. <laughs> harm to the health of Australians. That's a serious harm that disinformation and misinformation uh, rules could apply to. They, the example they give is, and I, I'm not joking when I'm reading that this is the example, and if all of your readers hear this or listeners hear this and just go, why this of all things? misinformation that caused people to ingest or inject bleach products to treat a, vir a viral infection. Oh, for fuck's sake. I'm not even kidding you. That is the example, that is the example they use of serious health, harm of health, health-related misinformation, serious harm. And then the next one, harm to the Australian environment. That's it. That's all they say, serious harm. Can Is there any conceivable world in which this would not be used to prosecute misinformation around climate change? Any conceivable world. Like... It, it beggars belief. If anyone would say that that would not be what this legislation would be used for, they are just living in an absolute dream world. Like I can't understand 
how this could not be plainly linked to that. The example they give is misinformation about water saving measures during a prolonged drought period in a major town or city. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, if we if we see anyone encouraging you know just to pour your water out onto the ground during a drought, that's the kind that's the kind of thing we're going to use. That's that misinformation yeah. we need to suppress. That is dangerous. Yeah. And then the final one is economic or financial harm to Australians, the Australian economy, or a sector of the Australian economy. So again, setting it up for corporate protection rackets, vested corporate interests. You know, what if so, it was what if it was found that the vaccine industry was a crucial sector of the Australian economy? That needed to be protected from misinformation like you know you, ha you have to have very little imagination or creativity to run semi trailers through the gaps in what this legislation could be used to do yeah i mean in theory that should uh, read the last one again sorry it was like serious harm yeah. to so, so economic or financial harm to australians yeah so they should be the censoring the reserve bank the sector of the australian economy yeah, they should be censoring the Reserve Bank. Reserve Bank should be uh, is now is now um, misinformation, disinformation as of instantly. Perfect. I'm actually behind this bill now. Um, <laughs> um, all right. So so really, like, it's basically saying whatever we choose, whatever whatever we want is on any given day. It, like, it's so broad, anything could be could fall under these things. Um, and and so, so, so the bill contains the definition of harm and outlines types of harm that would be considered. So the type of harm, the left hand column, the first thing I said is what's in the bill. Yeah. The second thing I said of the examples is what they're giving you in the guidance. So it's like, yeah, oh, yeah, here's yeah, an example yeah. of serious harm. Like, you know, see, yeah. it's pretty reasonable. And uh, yeah, it, it's that's not law. That doesn't no one's going to be able to stand in a court and say, but your guidance note said that it's <laughs> going to be about a drought. And then the, the judge is going to go, what are you high? Like, get the fuck out of my courtroom. <laughs> 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 no, it's a climate lockdown. Shut exactly. your mouth. Exactly. It's a climate infodemic. <laughs> All right. Um okay. Uh bef before we finished, I, I did want to do like a, a little bit of role playing. I don't know how successful this will be. I've never done it before. Um so we're we're testing it out for the first time. I'm gonna put my uh statist hat on. Okay. So as of right now, uh I'm I'm wearing I'm wearing a beanie for those of us who are just listeners. I have just become You're now Peter uh, the status. I'm now Peter the Statist. So <laughs> What's your alter ego? A new a new a new entity has been born tonight on Collective Artists. Yeah, this is um this is actually who I really am. I just, I just I've been masquerading <laughs> as a libertarian this whole time. This is this is, like... <laughs> this is great. Yeah. Um so okay. Um as a statist, and this is the kind of thing that uh, I imagine most of our uh like the, the viewers who do decide to hold these beliefs and push them or push them and, and talk about this kind of things with their friends and family. This is your, your uncle at, at Thanksgiving. This is the, the, or your family at Thanksgiving example of, of the just complete um, within the allowable opinion view that you might get. So um, again, this is, if you're, this is if you're allowed at family Christmas, if you've not had a vaccine and, and now you're back allowed at family gatherings again. Yeah. After yeah. The, yeah. Well, I'm the guy that I, where you weren't welcome. Yeah, I'm already. I already suck at this uh, role playing thing. I am the statist who would not yes, have allowed okay. you at the family gathering. Yes. Okay. So yes. first just of all, talking, we've just finished talking about cousin Jimmy who didn't get a vaccine, so he's not welcome yeah, to Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. Now yeah, we're exactly. going to talk about that. First, I'm going to ask: Are you up to date with your injections, Jordan? Um, and if not, would you mind sitting at the opposite end of the table to me, please? No. Um, um, despite, despite having had um, two shots, because as you would be aware from listening to the last podcast I featured in, I've put a lot of random shit in my body that has no potential benefit whatsoever. So I thought it was a weird, weird hill to die on to sort of just decide I'm not going to take this thing. I took it before it was mandatory. So I sort of did, I avoided my libertarian triggering of uh, basically resisting something I was being forced to do. And uh, despite having had two vaccinations, I am now not fully vaccinated and am just as much of a peasant as, as anyone else. So there you go. Yeah. That's, that's so, the so you, you haven't had seven and therefore no the answer is no <laughs> um and it, yeah okay uh i'll I don't, I don't even have my mask with me how am i okay this is i'm already stressed okay and we haven't even started talking about the fact that you are essentially uh looking to defend nazis um because i mean okay first of all the 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 government obviously has our best interest at heart as we all saw when they protected us through covid but um what could be wrong with wanting to silence like obviously harmful opinions like those of the nazi 
saluters at the Let Women Speak rally? Well, Peter, that's a really good question. And if the government cared about and wanted to prevent people from falling prey to a dangerous ideology that, that preys on and relies on social isolation, anger, um, alienation, and being pushed to the fringes of society, it's probably not a good idea to further fuel those conspiracy-minded sort of hateful ideologies by actually cracking down on them and pushing them even further, the further to the fringes of society. I would like to know who the Nazis are, where they are and where they're gathering. And if my neighbor's a Nazi, I'd love to know that so that I can either offer him some, some friendly counseling and guidance about why Nazism is bad. My family was in the Weimar Republic and Nazi Germany. Didn't end well, uh, <laughs> surprisingly enough. But the idea that by removing the opportunity for ideas you disagree with to be aired, you're somehow defeating these ideologies or changing how people are going to think is, is absolutely delusional. The opposite is going to happen. You're going to fuel underground communities. You're going to fuel anger and resentment, and you're going to, to build these communities and these ideologies rather than um, tear them down. Well, I'm, I'm looking to stamp them out. Like we can't, we can't possibly, Th these are hateful ideologies that just uh, uh, they just perpetuate themselves if you allow them to be open public discourse, and that's part of the reason why there's all these, um, you know, uh, the, all these groups on Telegram and whatever these these alt right types of groups are finding crowds that normally uh, they wouldn't be able to because the internet now has the ability to. Um, to reach uh, reach out with people all over the globe, whereas normally you might be one or two isolated people. Now these people are finding a hub and a hive, and these ideas are, are growing in these echo chambers of of racists and Nazis and all the rest of it. Shouldn't that be quelled? Shouldn't we be curtailing that? At an emotional level, it's really really easy to um, to feel like we should be doing something. That there should be that someone should do something. Won't someone please think of the children, you know, to, to quote the famous uh, Simpsons episode. But in reality, what is permissible and what is possible with technology doesn't really materially uh, make lesser or greater what the outcomes are likely to be. You're going to have um, groups of people who find one another, um, you know, th there's nothing to stop. For, for example, this legislation doesn't stop private messaging. You can have a WhatsApp group. Um, you can have um, private messaging that is encrypted that continues unabated. Um, all that you're going to do is you're going to break these communications down into smaller communications. And beyond the, the practicality of even if, you, even if you believe the way that you've just um, put a lot of people would believe, it's, it's not true to say that you should be um, stifling and um, silencing ideas and opinions that deserve to die a natural death. The only way that these ideas are actually going to be defeated, and the only way they have been defeated in history, is by being tested and exposed to the open air and oxygen of debate. Um, you can't, you know, to quote 1984, you can't change how people think by changing what they can say. You can't use language to frame thought. Um, that's, that's both a very, very ill-advised strategy and a very ineffective strategy and a very dangerous one because at some point um, the the tables might turn and Peter, the, the people like, like, you know, I spot, I'm, an, I'm imagining um, Peter would hate nobody more than John Howard or Tony Abbott. Imagine if Tony Abbott was was the Prime Minister, like we hate Tony Abbott, don't we? With Peter. God, hate Tony him. Abbott, the worst, yeah. right? Imagine if Tony Abbott and his Catholic ways were imposed on you and you in your in your uh, telegram group for rainbow flag, unicorn, goodness, whatever, suddenly you were being forced from these groups and Tony Abbott was trying to impose his Catholic ways, you know? Um, it's, uh, it's a blunt instrument. And just because a group of people you agree with or ideas you agree with are in the ascendant and the majority now, doesn't mean that will always be true. Well, I think the reason that my ideas are in ascendance is because uh, the the world is becoming more, as the world becomes more modern, a lot of the archaic views of the past are dying off and now the true progressive views of the world are finally coming to the forefront and then the world will just continue to become more and more progressive, obviously. Um, so right. I, history, history is a straight line and that's what we know from looking at yeah, history. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. Linear. 
Well, it has been for my whole life, so that's obviously <laughs> exactly what is going to happen. Um, look, I, I, um, I just suppose you. A lot of this stems from you not trusting, uh, I guess, how the government, not trusting that the government won't overuse these powers to expand into something more than just obviously silencing Nazis. Um, I mean, what do we have? What cause do we have to believe that the government won't overstep uh, its mandate on this? I mean, I, if I can't trust the government, who can I trust? Well, because you're a student of history, Peter, and, and you love history and even recent history, we don't have to go back very far to find many examples before COVID, before you know, social ideology or anything like that was the main um, sort of point of discourse or debate. Um, we had the Iraq War. Um, everybody worldwide, governments all around the world were absolutely convinced that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and it was necessary to invade Iraq in order to prevent you know, global holocaust. Uh, nuclear, nuclear weapons, biological weapons, whatever you could think of, Iraq had them. And you could not find a single person. Peter, I think had you been um, the age you are now and, and sort of interested in politics at that time, you would have been railing against this, this criminal government propagating these lies. You know, uh, we had people arriving in, by boat to Australia, um, children being thrown overboard allegedly, even though there was very little proof, if, if at all, that that ever happened. Um, we really don't have to look back very far to find examples of where government is no better or worse at working out what the truth of something is than the rest of us are. In fact, they usually follow the consensus and follow um, once things have been clearly debunked. In Australia, in the in the 50s and 60s, um, thalidomide was marketed as a drug for morning sickness and headaches and anxiety for pregnant mothers. And it was available on the Australian uh, version of the PBS. It was, it was subsidised by the government. The government said this is a safe drug for mothers to take. And then it turned out that it caused horrific birth defects. And now, of course, nobody would ever prescribe thalidomide to anyone within months of thinking about conceiving. Asbestos was once widely used in even government department construction of buildings because it was a safe, durable, cheap uh, piece of construction equipment that could never possibly have anything go wrong. And well, we all know what happened there, that in fact, asbestosis, um, leads to a horrific and long suffering death and uh, the government's still paying out massive amounts in compensation claims for that so we don't really have to look back very far to see very recent very numerous examples of where government is no better or worse than we are and, and that's the scariest that's the scariest truth to be honest that is probably one of the most terrifying things you can ever come to terms with and the more involved in politics you become the more clearly you can see it politicians are just us they are a reflection of us and so if you imagine what would they do or what would they, you know, if, if, if you had, if, if you were thinking, what would a politician do when they were faced with pushing the, the red button and condemning the world to nuclear war? The answer to that question is pretty much the same thing as you would do, except even worse, because they have all these expectations and, um, and uh, all these people wanting them to just do something. So uh, government, far from having any special expertise or truth or um, sense of what is right and wrong is just as flawed, ill-informed and behind the curve of, uh, of new knowledge as the rest of us. Yeah. And, and just as, uh, and worse than that, likely to respond to perverse incentives that, um, we wouldn't have a broken character back into character. <laughs> All right, Jordan, that's enough. That's, that's the 10 minutes that you were allowed at this Thanksgiving reunion. I'm going to have to ask you to leave now and scene all right i'll stop being a statist i've taken my status hat. I'll, I'll take a long shower uh after after we finish this recording to wash off the that the stink there um cool i mean i think i think uh that's the, that those those are all uh obviously really good points and i think um it's important that we arm ourselves with that sort of thing because i i like as much as this was a caricature i've heard I guarantee you, I could I could hear this um, kind of question, you know, tomorrow if I wanted to, if I asked to, to certain people within my uh, broad circles. Um, it's not it's not a, a minority opinion. Certainly, these really uh, not easily debunkable, but important that we debunk views. Um, 
All right. Well, we are we are a, a little bit past the hour mark now. Is there any last comments, thoughts, words that you are dying to let our viewers know that they need to know about this bill or about anything else that we've talked about today before we stop? Look, I feel like every time I talk to you, I've got bad news and, and the world gets a little bit darker. And unfortunately, that, that sort of is the way things are heading. But um, I think what this issue shows us is that we can't rely, even if you think that the current situation of wall to wall Labor governments is the worst possible outcome for the country imaginable, and you think that if only we had, you know, a Liberal Party in Canberra, which we did until recently, and they proposed this bill, you know, the, the truth is that until something changes and until we make a different choice and choose uh, a different way forward and a different way of looking at these issues um, than we have in the past, we're going to get the same results. Um, this is, I'm speaking from self-interest when I say this, but even a single Libertarian Party Senator in the Senate could potentially, if the numbers blew the right way and they were in a position where they had the balance of power and could decide whether a bill like this rose or fought or fell, um, would be in a position to apply our principles to um, ask for the bill to be repealed or significantly scaled back. I mean, this bill we would never vote for. Um, but people say like, oh, well, you know, what does it matter? Why vote, why vote for a minor party? Um, and I think we've seen how many minor parties can be bought or sold um, on the crossbench. You know, they've got special interests, your Rod Buttons from Transport Matters, your Jackie Lammies, you know, they all have a pet project or some pork barreling they want for their local electorates. Um, only by making a different decision can we expect any kind of different outcome. So please consider voting Libertarian. Vote Libertarian. That's that's a message I can wholeheartedly get behind. Um, now that the party name also reflects the ideology, finally, um, which is was another win. Um, perfect. I think that's a, that's a good spot to end it. Thank you so much for uh, joining us, joining me again. Uh, I'm sure we'll have you again on in the future, especially sometime that something so topical that your uh, extensive expertise can give us some insight on. So thank you very much. Stay tuned, uh, for, uh, stay tuned for our submission. <laughs> perfect. And stay tuned for the Libertarian Party submission. Uh, for those of us who don't already, please like us on uh, Instagram, follow us on YouTube, subscribe to us on Spotify. I, know, I always forget which one goes with which there, but just do the thing on the thing. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll catch you next time.